James Cars. I, I came across finite games and infinite games probably 10 or 15 years ago. And this whole book is summed up nicely in these words. There are at least two kinds of games. One can be called finite, another infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play, and to bring as many persons as possible into the game. Finite players play within boundaries, infinite players play with boundaries. Finite games are serious, infinite games are playful. That was a turning point for me when I read that, because for once it, it helped me to, to distinguish between what I see everywhere in our social systems and what I see the world needing. So it's very, very clear that the combination of all of our social systems is resulting in us being engaged in a finite game. The question is, what does an infinite game look like? Is, what's an example what's, uh, of an infinite game? Yeah. Nature. Absolutely. So throughout all of nature, <clears throat> you find the infinite game. It's been running for literally billions of years. It's moving toward including more and more species, more and more intricacy, more and more beauty, more and more consciousness, more and more resilience, up until the last 100 years. So, <laughs> so what is needed at this point in our evolutionary journey is for us to approach the elegance of the infinite game, which is built into all the rest of nature. Now, it's built into us as well, but we are given freedom of choice. We're the species that has freedom of choice. So we must choose to shift the game, or we end up being devastatingly finite as a species. We're a very, very young species, and certainly demonstrated our immaturity. <laughs> but the good news is we're a very, very young species. We haven't really gotten to <laughs> adult stage yet. And so that's what we're talking about tonight, is what might it take to do the rite of passage for our social systems to shift from finite games to infinite games. I love metaphors in general, it uh, has so much potency to me. The monarch caterpillar has the capacity to build this chrysalis around itself, then to dissolve its structures and to recreate those structures and to come out what looks like an entirely different species. The caterpillar is myopic. It doesn't look too far into the future. It is definitely dedicated to growth and to consumption. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> so collectively, our social systems are caterpillar-like. The caterpillar builds a chrysalis, but it comes out of the chrysalis as a creature that touches the earth lightly, that brings joy <laughs> when you see it through its beauty, and that is collaborative, cross-pollinating with different species. It can leave the earth, it can be airbound, it can travel great distances, fantastic. So there's nothing wrong with the caterpillar, but it's at an, an early stage of a life cycle. We are at an early stage as a species. So what we're going to go into this evening is what might it look like, what would it take for us to collectively grow the wisdom to support the metamorphosis of our social systems. This is a profound shift. This is not something that can come out of a proclamation. 
It's not something that we can expect to come out of our existing social systems for reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, emphasize later. But we have this potential. The same design genius that equipped the caterpillar to work this magic for itself is available to us. We just need to learn how to tune our antenna and be very open to playing a proactive role in listening and making a breakthrough in terms of how we connect with each other. There's a story that I read from a book by Nori Huddle called The Butterfly. This story is an imaginable cell story is the title of it. And it is our secret strategic plan for pulling off metamorphosis globally. That's our strategy. So there's imaginal souls. They're in rich attendance here tonight. But they're imaginal souls in every part of the world, in every organization, but they're scattered. And the immune systems can be very fierce. So the secret somehow has to be to tap into those imaginal souls and to find ways to support clumping and clustering and chaining together to see who they really are, because we are much more than we think we are. Each of us is much, much, much more than we think we are. And now's going to be the time to, to step up to that. So I mentioned social systems a few times. We live in <laughs> dozens of different social systems, and they're the they're like water to the fish. We, we don't think about them. We think they're a given. But the reality is, almost all of these social systems are man-made, quite literally. But we have created these over time. And we've created them mainly out of looking at what has been done before us. So we have social systems that, compared with the realm of technology are pretty archaic. We've gone through generations and generations and generations and generations and generations of technological change, but we haven't really examined our social systems. We haven't tapped into the potential we have for working together collectively. We talk about collaboration, we talk about innovation, what I'm saying is, we haven't designed our social systems to produce collaboration and innovation. And we can. There's no reason why we can't. All social, social systems are perfectly designed. Absolutely perfectly designed to get the results they get. You know, they're designed for the production and distribution of goods and services, for the acquisition of wealth and property, to manage nature, military might, create beauty, safety, security. Lots of, for the most part, pretty solid, worthy uh, intentions. And we get those results. There's been enormous progress in many dimensions from our existing social systems. The problem is, that there are unintended consequences that come from our collective social system. So let's zoom in on that particular picture. 900 million hungry people on the planet today. 900 million. Not many of us encounter hungry people, much less starving people. It takes about 22 days for somebody to die of starvation. We have 35,000 people dying starvation every day. So this is an unintended consequence of the collective design of our social systems. CO2 pollution, groundwater pollution, deforestation, ocean acidification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no question that there are adverse trends that are affecting us, 
and the, the ecologists, the scientists are saying that we're getting close to a slippery slope, that there may be already movement in these what you call slow variables that are becoming irreversible. And a lot of these tend to multiply each other. You know, we're seeing the relationship between hunger and poverty and, and uh, violence. Get hungry enough, you do what it takes to get, to get your food, et cetera. So the challenge to us is, how do we redesign our social systems? So let's, let's move on, see if we can figure it out. If you look at social systems as finite games, here is what I would infer their design principles to be. As finite games, they're distinguished, almost all of them, by a narrow and or myopic definition of success. An infinite game would define success in terms of net contribution to the well-being of life. We don't have that kind of accounting system yet, but that's what's needed. So the difference between a finite game and infinite game is finite game, we want to be the best in the world, right? The infinite game, it's we want to be the best for the world. Huge shift, huge shift from very narrow focus, next quarter focus, or next election focus, to really caring about the quality and the health and the resilience of all of life. Another design principle, essentially all of our large systems are designed for control over people and our nature. Infinite games, the organizations would be designed to actualize the full potential of people and nature together. That's a hugely more complicated challenge. It looks, if you look at almost all of our complex systems, it's almost as if they're designed to resist change. They're designed to be smoothly working, predictable, stable systems for the most part. As infinite games, they would be designed to self-evolve, to be looking at and anticipating the changes and looking at what does it take for us to be resilient, to be sustainable, and to maximize our contribution to all of life. So we're at an extraordinarily interesting choice point. So we're at a point right here in 2011, and we have the capability, we have the resources, we have what it takes to choose any within those two extremes. Essentially all of the social systems in the yellow, orange, red zone are, are based upon kind of finite game rules, finite game design, if you will. And when we switched up to the green zone, which we're calling sustainable, there you're making a big shift from looking at an organization as a machine to an organization as a living system. And when you really take seriously that this is a living system and not a bunch of replaceable parts, so this is a major shift. It's not easy for systems to make that particular jump. The point I'm wanting to make here is that we're at a choice point. So we're just now getting to the point where we're becoming conscious of just how how treacherous our position is as a species. And we also, thanks to the information age, have created the capacity to connect with each other throughout the planet. Einstein says, make, make your theory as simple as possible, but no simpler. So this is my shot at, at describing the cause-effect relationship between social systems and what's happening on the planet. So, as I see it, the unintended consequences, remember the big circle and all the slow variables, they are a direct result of our patterns of living, of thinking, of working, of communicating. They're all pattern derived. How do we behave? How do we consume, etc.? Result of our patterns. These patterns in turn are pretty much set by our social systems, by the overlay of all those circles and ovals. They all have an influence on us, sometimes in the way of rules and laws, sometimes just habits. And I've 
chosen to break apart the social system into what I think are the two primary uh, independent variables, if you will. Stories and structures. So stories are, are stories. They are fables. They are our metaphors. They're our beliefs, our values. They're the inner conversations we have and the outer conversations we have. Structures, roles, rules, systems, processes, buildings, highways, computer systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You'll notice with these unintended consequences that there's absolutely no feedback between these unintended consequences and the design, the systems that source the patterns, that source the consequences. So our task, if we are to transform our collective caterpillar-like society to the butterfly, if we're to go through self-metamorphosis, is to adjust our stories and adjust our structures. So which are easier to work with? Stories or structures? Yeah. Yeah. I learned a long time ago in my 35-year experience with organizational change work is that you don't start with structure. You don't start with structure. And you don't fight the ex existing story. You create a story that's, that's so superior to the existing story that people align around it. So that's what's happening here this evening. I'm attempting to describe the story as we've been experiencing it. I have a request of you this evening, some work that I want you to be doing. Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. It's a preview of coming attractions. I want to ask you to assume that Silicon Valley has the option of consciously moving toward its ideal 2020 future, and that that process just happens to be started tonight. You are the pioneers of the metamorphosis of Silicon Valley. So let's pretend, let's just play that's the case. And what I want you to be doing is given that you're each special beings with extraordinary gifts that you may or may not have tapped into yet, given that you have the potential to multiply the lasting difference that you are making for life on the planet, what is the role that you would like to play in this decade-long action learning journey in helping Silicon Valley move toward its ideal 2020 future. What's the role that would give you the greatest joy to be playing? This is all play, okay? But I'm gonna, I wanna hear from you at the, end of, uh, at the end of this evening as to just what that role might be. Okay, the difference with the happy face when you're up in the blue-green zone, uh, for one thing, you start out defining what, what consequences you want. <laughs> You don't just decide how to build your organizations and then live with what the consequences are. You start with what is it you want? What is it we want as a region? What's really, really important? What do we value? And then we look at what patterns can get us there and then what stories and structures will support it. But most importantly, we weave in feedback loops so that it's possible for systems to be held accountable for their net contribution to the well-being of life.
this is sort of like a Richter scale. To take a system from that's here and go to the orange is almost a tenfold shift in terms of the, the well-being of, of who's affected by it. Same way in going from here to yellow, from here to green, and so on. So it's a major shift, major undertaking to take our organizations, which are mostly in the yellow, to move that to the next level is, is huge. Many of you in this room know uh, of Doug Engelbart or know Doug Engelbart. Uh, his, his, his inventions were incredible, but the one that struck me most significantly was the distinction between A work, B work, and C work. So A work is recurring work. Whether you're a brain surgeon or whether you're a, uh, a CEO or whether you are doing custodial work, your A work is kind of the recurring work. B work is work that's intended to improve the purposefulness, the, the effectiveness and or efficiency of A work. Okay, it's intended to. So we've still got this scale of quality here. The intention may be well off the mark, okay? So the quality of A work can vary from red to blue. The quality of B work can vary you know, from toxic to generative. C work is work that's intended to optimize B work options. So if you look at the question, how do we take what we know about individual transformation and organizational transformation and apply that to all systems within a region? That's a, a major C work question. There used to be a pretty reason, a reasonable number of people with C work expertise. And they existed in large corporations that did a lot of change work and had professionals who were managing and working with a lot of different change initiatives. They in turn worked with a lot of different consultants and a lot of different methodologies. And they witnessed these change efforts through time. And very frequently they were failures. That's how you get to be a sea worker, is you, you experience a lot of different approaches to change. So we don't have many people who have had a lot of experience in that realm. So one of our challenges will be, how do we grow that? How do we grow that capacity? I've done a lot of, of rainbow lens analysis of different organizations where I would survey them. And so this is just my approximate qualitative picture of what, what would be the amount of work that's done at these various levels of quality in the A work category, in the B work category, and in the C work category. And so what this suggests is that, I think it's even more extreme than what this shows, is that essentially all of our energy, all of our money expenditure in organizations is to do the A work. And as things get tighter and tighter, and you reduce forces, you spend less and less time thinking and trying to figure out how to do better. You don't have time. It takes time to do B work, even more time to do C work. So this is, the, this is what I see to be the distribution of amount of work in you know, a hypothetical region. And this is about the quality range. Mostly, mostly yellow, fair amount of orange, and a little bit of green. So if we're to move to an ideal region, what would our target be? And so the next picture shows a desired 2020 state. So it'd be a big breakthrough if in 10 years we could, our social systems in a given region could in essence move up. That would be a tenfold shift in the lasting contribution to the well-being of life. Now a tenfold shift in anything seems impossible. But if you look at the fact that a lot of our systems today are making a negative contribution to the well-being of life, collectively, then it's not so hard to make a tenfold ten shift. The base case is pretty shabby. 
But my experience in working with systems that a tenfold shift in the lasting difference, and that's another key word, lasting. What's a lasting difference? How do you make a lasting difference in a world that's changing? Do you build a better machine? <laughs> no. You need to grow the social organism in a way that it is able to deal with change and deal with it very close to the source. So you become more modularized. You empower people <laughs> throughout the organization. You recognize that you can't control through a chain of command, etc. And magic can happen. Magic can happen. I had a, one of the most profound learning experiences in my career in change work happened very, very early in, uh, I pretended my way into being an organization development consultant back in 75 in Exxon. And Exxon was not an easy place to pretend your way into. But um, I did, and um, I met a fellow named Herb Stokes. And Herb was with Procter & Gamble. And he was an engineer, but he had gotten really deep into living systems theory, and he had, he had uh, connected with some socio-technical systems uh, uh, gurus. And they were doing some radical stuff within Proc Procter and & Gamble. And he invited me, he snuck me into, because it was proprietary technology, what they were doing in terms of organizational design. He snuck me and a couple of my managers, some of my more recalcitrant managers, into their organization. So this is in Albany, Georgia, 1975. They started up a thousand person paper plant with 40% blacks, 20% women. And this was in 75 when you had the race riots, when the gender issue was a, a real big issue. Nobody in the community wanted them to do that. They were all afraid. They were all afraid. But they did it because they felt it was right, that it was a living system. You want the people who are in the system, in a given system, to represent the, the, uh, uh, the stakeholders, the environment that they're in. They, they equipped the people in that plant to deal with the differences in gender and race. They gave them training and communication skills, and they designed them in teams where they were responsible for essentially everything, not only the running and the management of their teams, but they were responsible for their relationships with the other teams and how they managed the boundaries in the other teams. They were responsible for their own development. The role of management was to support them and equip them to develop their capacity to live up to those responsibilities. That was in 1975. They're still going strong. Procter & Gamble has enormous uh, success in the realm of diversity. And this plant was been the fountainhead for a whole lot of, of that kind of leadership growth. I've not experienced another plant or another organization that is that much in the green zone. Our challenge is to find a way to develop the capacity within a region to equip the social systems in the region where the leadership is committed to transforming themselves to support them with the expertise, with the, with the infrastructure, as needed to do what they are committed to do. In other words, there's no top-down solution that's possible here that will work. And so the key is, how do you develop the capacity within the region to support the social systems in the region to transform themselves? It's only going to happen if it's in their self-interest. OK, it's not something you can legislate. What is needed is a, an infrastructure that supports education on an across-the-region basis that permeates all of your systems and calls into play the, the work-life balance and it absolutely includes central to this educational process the inner work 
and the relational work and the neighborhood work and the community work, that that becomes as visible, as measurable, as, as important as everything that's easy to measure. So that's, that's a big part of the, of the shift. From the yellow zone, you're, you're still dualistic. Green zone, it's living systems, man. You, you really get, and it's a part of, of the shared belief that we're all connected. And it isn't an either or game. There's a lot of either orness around the material aspects of living, but in terms of relationship, in terms of our own inner development and our outer development, it's not a zero sum game. And so that's a major shift, and it needs to happen at a systemic level. So it's a, a wonderful challenge. But we also want it to be large enough to be politically significant. The goal in these goals is to, to set goals that everyone wants and that are kind of impossible, that go beyond simply solving some problem. So we're talking full co-creative partnership with the rest of nature. Just minimizing our damage to nature, but full co-creative partnership. Success redefined as the contribution to well-being of life that you impact. Opportunities for all to go full Maslow. Can you think what a shift that would make, what a difference that would make in your region if everyone had an opportunity to go, the opportunity to go full Maslow? I mean, think of what percentage, what high percentage on this planet are struggling to be able to get a hold of the first rung, all systems self-evolving. Unless you have that kind of intention, you definitely aren't going to get close to it. And so these kinds of goals help people to think differently. They help people to cut, cross boundaries. When we're talking about the metamorphosis of a region or a society or of any organization, we're talking about transformation at various levels of system. You're talking about inner work. You're talking about relational work. You're talking about group work. You're talking about organizational work. You're talking about neighborhood. You know, there's all manner of complex relationships that exist. And so to undergo a metamorphosis, transformation needs to occur at, at all those different levels. Unless you're really supporting movement on an inner level and an outer level, you know, you're, you're, you're likely to be wasting your energy. And so this honors the fact that metamorphosis for uh, systems and for people involve multiple iterations, kind of on and on and on. And what this represents is time when you're together and you're reflecting, you're supporting each other, you're hearing each other's stories, you're uh, envisioning, you're creating, you're building relationships, building agreements, etc. And then times when you're, when you're in, in, uh, uh, out in the world in one way or another and you're applying, and you're learning, and then you're coming back. And so education, as, as we see it, in the age of conscious evolution, has this as an ongoing element. It's part of, it becomes part of the A work. B and C work becomes a part of the A work. This, these strands get woven throughout your systems. But really, you need to weave these throughout your neighborhoods, throughout your communities, throughout your organizations. Uh, so this is the, the fundamental uh, DNA, if you will, in an age of conscious evolution. And we have examples of this. I mean, people who you know, go to therapy or they have you know, the AA for a long time. It's been a classic example of this. And that's transformational for, for millions of people, literally. So I'm going to challenge you all to, to look at what's the role that Silicon Valley, that you want Silicon Valley to play, that you as Silicon Valley want to play. So basically what we're looking at in Mises is two broad strategies. One would be the regional metamorphosis initiative. 
So we've had some introductor, uh, introductory story telling within the Salinas Valley, Monterey Bay region. I've had more extensive conversations, Marilyn and I had more extensive conversations with two groups at, uh, New Ze at Wellington region in New Zealand. So we planted seeds there. And this is a seed planting in Silicon Valley. And so we're wanting to find a home region, a region that'll serve as a petri dish for the planet. To see just what's the art of the possible in terms of how do you support the transformation of social systems throughout the region, the neighborhood systems, the organizational systems, the governments, the associations, whatever. What does it take to do that? So that's one strategy. And we've been mostly focusing on Salinas Valley, Monterey Bay, but I want, I want to find where, where is a region where there is sponsorship, where there's the energy, where there's support. The other strategy, we're calling it the Global Guild of Evolutionary Architects. So the architect of the future is not going to be an individual. It's going to be a, a bringing together of expertise from a lot of domains. Because the name of the game is, what will best serve all of life? And you need to draw from the best of technology, from the best of social architecture, from the best of environmental uh, expertise. Always start with place. Next, look at what's the context, what's the story that will draw forth what's possible. We want to find out where in the planet the most generative work is happening in communities and regions. Which methodologies seem to be most applicable to regional transformation? And it's easy to attract those people <laughs> if you know them and can recognize them and can, can really see what they're doing. All of them are pretty much carrying the whole load on their shoulder of trying to get their particular piece of the, <laughs> of the action out there in a way that makes a difference. Let's find a region where you have the support for really going all out in this region. And let's challenge the expertise of the planet. How would your work spread in an organic way? What's the most highly leveraged way, the most generative way for your particular work to show up in a way that really makes a difference? So the experts in the, in, in the realm of change, in the realm of design, really lap up that kind of opportunity. So we're wanting to find a way to grow that community. So this is our 10 most wanted evolutionaries. And basically what we're saying is that um, is that we need to grow an ecosystem that is rewarding the development of the capacity to develop our system's capacity to transform themselves. The, the Silicon Valley phenomenon comes out of the fact that you had conditions here that supported growing an ecosystem of investors and entrepreneurs and providers and suppliers and journalists. And it's out of that flow and, and interaction that you, it has grown and has made the difference, that it's birthed the information age saying it's going to take a, a, another kind of ecosystem around a different realm of expertise that includes the technology realm heavily, but which has us be cre as creative in our social forms and in our relational forms and in our developmental forms as we have been with our things, our toys, our technology. Well, as, as Bill mentioned, uh, we are developing together the Global GIA, uh, which is the global infrastructure and, and resource and uh, uh, expertise builder. Um, obviously, we've been uh, focusing on developing the story uh, and kind of broader strategies. Um, and we, trust me, with intense discussions, how do we uh, take this whole thing forward? Because obviously, it's huge and. Uh, it's, it's a really broad network, a really broad framework, and it's more of a worldview, and, uh, you know, a collection of lets. Um, so how do we uh, make it practical without wrapping around 
uh, you know, a single particular problem, which is not really what this is about. This is really about building um, the capacity to solve any problem, to look at any problem differently. So that's something that I think of uh, every minute of my uh, day. <laughs> that answers the question. So uh, I think that what we should try to do is see if we can make Silicon Valley be a regional metamorphosis leader. The internet belongs to us. Sorry to sound so nationalistic, but we are. <laughs> if the car is parked in our driveways, we've got the keys to the car. We know how to drive it. We know how it works. We know how to change it. We and we have humility. <laughs> <laughs> The issue is, if the whole world economy is going to be wrapped around the internet and it's our car, we should actually get up and talk about where it should drive. Yes. We've got the people, we've got the technology, we've got the company, we've got the capital, we have angel investors in this room, we have world-class technologists in this room, we've got world-class entrepreneurs. We have what it takes to be a center for regional networks. So let's do it. And so that's the simple recap. And in order to do that, uh, Bill's rounded up the men from MISA, and five weeks from today, we are going to get together. But we are going to get together and continue this conversation. So anybody who feels like they want to actually do something besides talk about it, <coughs> show up, and we'll give you a shovel. <laughs> and we're going to start digging. There's no better place than here. There's no better time than now. There's no better group of people than us. I'm, I'm serious. I'm really serious. This is the Florence of the 21st century, right here. Northern California, Silicon Valley, has the greatest concentration of wealth and brains that has ever existed anywhere except for Florence during the Renaissance. This is the place.